Mosed. You're here on Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. I'm really excited to say that we have D.A. Wallach here, live videoing in from uh, bright and sunny L.A. Good to be here. D.A., uh, there's there's a lot to learn about D.A., but uh, we we met in the world of healthcare. Basically, D.A., has you've invested in a number of um, biotech companies at early stages, some healthcare tech companies. You've been a business executive in many kind of tech companies prior to uh, your, your, your tech and, and healthcare biotech investing days. Um, you have a pretty amazing Wikipedia here that I'm looking at and an amazing pool here with a, with a really cool pink flamingo float. But anyway, amazing background. Why don't you give us kind of what, what's, what's the overview about yourself? How did you get into this world of biotech, healthcare tech investing? Sure. So the short story is I graduated from college. I'd started a rock band in school and we got a big record deal. And so my first career was making music and touring and doing rock shows all over the world. And then about eight years ago or nine years ago now, I uh, threw my first foray into venture capital, um, became an investor in Spotify. And that really pivoted me into the world of investing and led to a series of investments that I made in other technology startups like Ripple and SpaceX and Doctor On Demand. And I discovered over a few years that I really had a passion for the healthcare system, trying to fix big problems in it, um, and that there was a sort of renaissance happening right now in biotechnology that was making possible um, solutions to some really serious diseases that we've been unable to cure for a long time. And so as an investor, I made the decision that I really wanted to direct my energies at trying to cure um, really difficult diseases. And then second to that, to try to enhance the efficiency and the quality of our healthcare systems around the world um, in my own little way as an investor by trying to support entrepreneurs who are building companies in and around healthcare um, that, that we're trying to make stuff work a little better. You've had some obviously big names in investing before now with the emphasis you've had in the biotech space. We've also had a number of very exciting investments in your portfolio is quite impressive just on the healthcare biotech side as well, which leads to this article that you put up uh, last week on Medium, the paradox of pricing. I think this is the first part of a promised multiple series of articles Um and what was prompted by, I'll, you know, I'll give a little bit of overview, but I want you to go deeper into this, but prompted by a lot of the debates that are happening in the political spectrum here about what to do with healthcare, what to do with drug pricing. And um, you are able to just go much deeper into the nuances of it than you're going to be able to catch on any kind of, you know, video snippet or, or, or live debate where it's all just about kind of beating everyone up. Um but you really dig into the nuance between, for example, the difference between list price, net price, the role of regulation with the ACA, uh, also known as Obamacare, and how all of these different uh, systems are kind of codependent upon one another. And this tension that is just kind of grinding everyone to basically not make any material progress. That's my general overview without actually describing much about what you've actually said, but why don't you take us into, you know, some of the discussion points, and then I want to start to unravel this uh, layer by layer and just go much deeper into it because it's a very important problem. Well, the first thing I would say is that the reason I wrote that article and the reason I, I continue to write is that it helps me straighten out what I've learned as I go around talking to smart people and trying to understand our healthcare system. And one of the challenges in looking at the US healthcare system is that it's just so big that it's really difficult, um, even when you do it for a living, to understand what the heck is going on. And so um, it has taken me years to even have a working understanding of how drugs are priced, how hospitals get paid, this sort of thing. Um, and, and honestly, part of why I write something like this is when you, when you put that out in the world, you hear back from a lot of people 
who will even correct or add layers of complexity to what you wrote. So um, I, I just want to preface what I'm going to say with a caution that I almost certainly am getting some things wrong. And um, I welcome feedback from your guys' viewers because I'm always continuing to, to better understand how this crazy system we got works. So that's the first point. The second point I want to make is that in healthcare, um, there, there's a good friend of mine who basically says there are man-made problems and there are science problems. And most of the time in my investing, I'm really focused on the science problems. You know, biology is really complicated. Diseases like cancer and heart disease, neurodegeneration are really complicated. And we try to solve those through scientific approaches. You know, in other words, if we can get a technology that's able to intervene in those diseases, that's a great way to solve them. But yet, you have that other class of problems, which are man-made problems. And our healthcare system is just a phenomenal example of humans creating a disaster of complexity <laughs> and inefficiency. And it's not like there was one bad guy or girl who did it. It's evolved over in the United States, you know, a couple hundred years. And what really prompted me to write this article was I was watching the Democratic primary debates. And what I heard over and over again was very thoughtful, smart politicians demonizing pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies. And this is not an uncommon message. What you hear is those greedy, evil pharma companies or those greedy, evil insurance companies. And they're easy to blame because, you know, who loves their health insurance company? I mean, it's kind of just this part of your life that you wish you didn't have to spend money on. Um, and then we hear at the same time these headlines about drugs coming out that cost a million dollars per dose or two million dollars per dose. Um, everyone, you know, w was um, really appalled by the Martin Shkreli, um, mm -hmm. you know, fiasco a couple years <laughs> ago. And if you remember, what he was doing was buying these uh, drug companies, buying these drugs that were treating very rare diseases. And then because he had a monopoly, he was just jacking the prices up through the roof to the point where patients couldn't afford these things. So what I wanted to do was not necessarily let anyone off the hook for bad behavior. I mean, big companies do all kinds of bad stuff, all kinds of big companies, and that includes drug companies and insurance companies. But I wanted to try and reveal some of the nuance and complexity that drives why our drugs seem to be so expensive. So the, the, the first thing I want to say, which I didn't actually include in the article, I, I will in the next article, is that of the three and a half trillion-ish that we spend on healthcare, we only spend about 12 to 15% of that on drugs. And the drugs that we have are responsible for many of us being alive today. I mean, just take antibiotics um, as one class of drugs, and they're responsible for one of the greatest creations of human life in history. I mean, so many people used to die just from bacterial infections. So we have the drug industry to thank for a lot of the uh, benefits we've harvested in healthcare. And then you also have, of course, these breakthrough drugs, like some of the ones that cost a million dollars that have come out in the past few years. And part of why those drugs are so expensive is because one, they're very expensive to develop and get to the market. And second, in some cases, they're very expensive to manufacture, hundreds of thousands of dollars per patient even. Um, but at the same time, you've had over the past few years um, this seeming increase in the prices that are charged for drugs like insulin that have been around for a long time that are sort of a commodity. And those are the ones that have really... Um, created some problems for patients who, because of high drug prices, are even not taking the drugs they need to stay alive um, because of that cost issue. So I, I really wanted to explain just the basics of how this works. And um, if you want me to, I can jump into those basics. Yeah, let's, let's jump on in. Okay. So, you know, this is old news for people who are in the pharmaceutical industry, but that's not most of us. And that's why I really wanted to explain just one part of it 
as simply as I could. And that is something you referred to earlier, which is that we have at the basic level two prices for drugs. Um, on the one hand, we have the quote unquote list price. And that you could think of that's the price on the box. When you pay at the pharmacy, that's the price on the receipt. That's the price that's kind of like the manufacturer's suggested retail price, the MSRP. And um, that price is what the pharmacy will charge when you go and get the drug. Now, there's a, another price, which is called the net price. And the net price is a little more complicated to get to. And to, to talk about the net price, we first have to talk about what happens when you buy that drug. So let's start from the factory. This big pharmaceutical company has made a pill, and they now sell it to a wholesale distributor. That distributor, say the drug has an a MSRP of $100, a list price of $100. Well, they might be selling that drug to the wholesaler for, call it, $85. And now the pharmacy is going to buy that drug for $90. So now the pharmacy, you go into Walgreens, Walgreens has bought that drug for $95. Now they've got it sitting on their shelf. And so the wholesaler obviously makes a $5 margin. And now Walgreens, when you walk in, is going to ask you, Alex, who's your insurance company? And you're going to say it's you know Blue Cross. And so your pharmacy is going to call Blue Cross. Sometimes they even pick up the phone and call them. And they're going to see what the negotiated price is for your insurance plan. And that price may be, you know, $95. Um, so the list price, in theory, is going to come down to $95 because you've got an insurance plan that calls it $95. So the pharmacy is going to bill your insurance company the $95, and then they're going to give you the drug. And, um, it, you know, if it were that simple, this would be very straightforward. But what's happening on the back end is that your insurance company has actually negotiated with that pharmaceutical company a rebate. The rebate might be $50. So as soon as your insurance company has paid for that drug, remember they're giving the $95 to the pharmacy. So now the pharmacy has made a $5 profit, the wholesaler has made a $5 profit, and your insurance company is out 95 bucks, but now they're gonna get $50 back from the manufacturer of the drug. So their net price is $45. And as you can tell, there's a, a big gap between the quote unquote list price, here you know, we can say 95, and the net price of 45. Now what has been going on is that the, um, the list prices, have gone up and up and up for the past several years. And what I tried to explain in the article is that the reason they're going up is because a lot of people in this system are basically addicted to these rebates for business reasons. And so your insurance company would rather get a big rebate than they would just pay $45. In other words, they would prefer that the list price is high, but the net price is low, than that the net price were just low. So that's yeah. And you actually the, explained the it's it's not just the pharmacy, which is there's a, a a fancy word called PBM, pharmacy benefit manager, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. But you also were giving examples about um, HR departments that are when you have a, a self insured plan from an employer, and now you are also able to um, kind of negotiate rebate amounts and these kinds of things. And what you're basically saying was there's a lot of vested interest on the business side of the industry for multiple players that, that, that argue that they create value in the face of a market that has a complete lack of pricing transparency. Um, would you agree with that roughly? I would, and I would just add to it that this is, um, this is why I'm writing this series of articles because you would, in any market, typically ask, well, what's the price of something? In the healthcare industry, what makes one of the things that makes it so challenging to understand is that there isn't one price. 
in this case, we've already talked about, you know, four different prices, the wholesaler price, the pharmacy price, the net price, the rebate, the list price. And so it's very hard to figure out what anything costs because of all these different prices. Mm -hmm. You were also saying that another vested interest is complying with the law, with Obamacare about how you you can only have a certain amount of your expenses be allocated to different pockets. And so by having higher list prices, it p makes it easier to basically comply with uh, the Obamacare law. Um, You've got to spend 80% of premiums taken in basically on health care for right. people. So if they're spending more on the list price for a drug, then it's easier to comply with that 80% ratio, even if they then get stuff back in rebates. Is that roughly right, DA? Yeah. The, the issue is that if you're an insurance company, you know, you collect a, a million dollars from the people you insure. Um, under Obamacare, you, you are required to spend 80% of that premium on right. covering those people's health care costs. And as I point out in the article, the reason they put this in Obamacare was before that, you had insurance companies who were going after these crazy margins. And so uh, that policy attempted to cap the, the margin, the profit margin that an insurance company could generate. Now, it creates many perverse incentives. One of those incentives is, of course, if you want your 20% to be bigger, what do you do? Well, you want all of the costs to be higher because the insurance companies you know, are capped on a percent basis, not a total right. absolute cost basis. And so that's a, <laughs> you know, the insurance companies by and large are sort of on the right side of history right now. Like they want in most cases to figure out how to deliver care efficiently, but their economic interest may in fact be to grow the expense of healthcare, which is unfortunate. And the other one that, that we were talking about before the show was, I was looking up CVS's 10K and they break out here their uh, percentage of revenues. You can basically see, well, the the weird thing is whenever the numbers stay exactly the same, um, you can see we've got like 75% in 2016 and 2017 as pharmacy. Whenever the numbers are exactly the same, that's always a little wonky. Um, but anyway, so pharmacy grew into 2018 and if you were now to 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 instead of having these list prices which keep going up, I think there's studies that say that you know the net price might actually be somewhat even or it might gone up. It'll if it does go up, it certainly has gone up less than list price. But anyway, you know from a an accounting standpoint for a CVS and some of their valuation is based off of their their revenue calcs and revenue growth or lack thereof. But you don't want to take, even if it's a 5% blow to the pharmacy revenue, if it's 75% of your revenue, and even if your hypothetical example about 100% list, 95 net were the case, I think in some cases it might actually be a larger discrepancy from list to net. That, from a financial standpoint, from an uh, investor standpoint, really starts to wreak havoc from their financial reporting. So you have all of these systems that have been built up on kind of this is the way we've done it. And now you've got regulation, which is further compounding upon it. And people are basically staking their livelihoods, uh, kind of living in the shadows. And, and, and in the sense that all of these, we do a lot of stuff in these dis, dis, B2B distribution industries. And what every single person in the B2B distribution industry will tell you, PBMs, and, and this is basically B2B distribution, um, everyone tells you the margin is in the shadows in the sense that the margin is in a market that has a lack of pricing transparency. When there's a lack of pricing transparency, now you have the ability to negotiate and you have this wiggle room. And, and there's so much of this well, kind you, of these backdoor dealings. Big asymmetry of information between the uh, insurance company or the payer and you know an average consumer or a drug company and the average consumer. And when there isn't price transparency, that in asymmetry gets bigger and it's much easier for these companies to take advantage of. Now, I, I will, you know, the, the flip side, none of this is, uh, you know, there aren't easy solutions here. And that's part of the right. argument of my essay. Um, you know, there's one philanthropist, John Arnold, who has actually dedicated a huge amount of philanthropic uh, energy and money to trying to solve this drug pricing issue. And John Arnold has dug very deeply into PBMs and how all of these payments flow. He wrote an op-ed 
that uh, argues, for example, that, that you shouldn't actually outlaw rebates. So, you know, one idea here, an obvious idea would be, why don't you just get rid of these rebates from the system? They seem so distortionary. But John Arnold's argument was, if the insurance companies can't go and negotiate with the pharma companies, and remember, the pharma companies often have monopolies because of patents. So if they release a new drug, now they're selling this drug. They may be the only one in the world selling this drug. And they go and negotiate with each of the insurance companies separately. Well, if the rebates are the way that that negotiation happens, right? If the list price is the same for all the insurance companies, but the difference in their net price is really driven by how big of a rebate they get. John Arnold actually argued you don't want to get re rid of rebates because if everyone can see what the others are paying, it actually gives the pharma company more leverage. In other words, counterintuitively, having more transparency here could actually lead to higher prices because people would lose their negotiating leverage. So, you know, I'm just trying to diagnose one part of the problem or, or even just explain it to a, a lay reader. Um, when you actually get into how you might mechanically fix this thing, it is so difficult. And behind every door are, you know, five more doors. What do we know, right? We know that CVS and Aetna merged. Um, and, and, and we know that, I mean, if you look at CVS is just kind of like their, their non-pharmacy business, clearly it's in decline. Who's really going into a CVS to buy your day-to-day -day goods, right? I mean, that business is getting destroyed by Amazon. Um, but these, the margins from the PBM business, uh, are very sustainable. CVS, basically CVS health. I mean, they're going all in into health, right. Um, and putting trying to put more services around that. So they, you know, if they're, if, if the PBM channel is threatened, which we're going to talk about Amazon and PillPack in a second, we see consolidation in my mind to help preserve uh, and tie payer with PBM and where the payers, the, the, the Aetna's, the health insurers of the world would, will, would and contract with multiple PBMs. If you put the two things together, you put the money, the payer and the PBM together, you're now just going to make that a much stickier um, and, and relationship, put more leverage. And the PBM is now, in my mind, more protected than if it's not um, attached to the payer. Um, so we've seen that we've seen, we've seen multiple kind of, uh, multiple kind of rounds of this consolidation on the, on the PBM kind of payer side. Um, and then you have Amazon with PillPack buying uh pill pack for like $750 million and leading up to that acquisition, there was multiple stories about how express scripts was saying, Oh, you misrepresented yourself to us as a, as a retailer. Um, not a mail delivery uh, pharmacy company. And so now, you know, we're going to look at kicking you off. They, they waged they a whole campaign. The, the pill pack was calling up on behalf of customers that it hadn't signed up and all these kinds of wonky things as well, which pill pack denied, obviously. Right. And, um, and lo and behold, I think they were talking to Walmart about, about an acquisition. Um, they were talking to... I don't know, Walgreens, they were talking to a couple of players. Walmart definitely was one of them. Um, they ultimately tied up with Amazon. And the you, you said an interesting thing earlier when you were talking about the generic versus these branded drugs, right? So, and how the pharmacies, the PBMs tend to make higher margin on the generic drugs. Could you describe that again a little bit? Sure. So, um just to radically oversimplify things, um, generic drugs are those that are no longer patented. Um, in other words, uh, the pharma company that invented them no longer has a monopoly on it, and other manufacturers, in, in many cases, have now been able to produce the same product. And when this happens, typically the price, of course, goes way down, because now it's essentially a commodity. And so, the pharmacies um, historically have made a very high margin selling generic drugs because they can either buy them or even buy them themselves. That's why when you go into you know, a CVS, you'll see Advil and then you'll see the CVS Advil right next to it. And of course, you'll have 
five rows as many of the CVS one because they really want to sell you that one. <laughs> and so they, they make quite a high margin historically selling generic drugs because they buy them for almost nothing. And then they can mark them up to a, a sort of retail price that's significantly higher. On the other hand, the so-called branded drugs, these are the on-patent drugs, they typically make a relatively low margin on, as I described. So from a pharmacy standpoint, they need to sell you those branded drugs because that's what many people are getting prescriptions for. Many people are coming in there, they need that prescription filled for a, a branded drug. The pharmacy will do that and accept making a relatively small margin on it because when you're in the store, that means you're also going to buy some shampoo, you may buy some CVS Advil, you'll buy a bunch of things where they make much more money. And so you've had um, a, an attack on the pharmacies over the past few years with companies like GoodRx or Blink Health, in which I was an investor, um, that are really focused on bringing down those margins that the pharmacy captures on the generic drugs. And so um, just as a rule of thumb, the pharmacies make a lot of money on the generics. The pharma companies make a lot of money on the branded. And in the course of generating those profits, PBMs and to some extent insurance companies um, make money off of both categories. Now, the, the PBMs, just to be clear, are essentially companies that function as agents for the insurance companies. So insurance companies hire a PBM to go and negotiate with all the drug companies what size rebates they will get when their patients receive those drugs. And in exchange, what the PBMs do is they determine what are called formularies. These are the catalog of drugs that patients who have that insurance will be eligible to receive. So if two different companies say, have drugs that are roughly equivalent, the PBM will go to each of them and they'll say, look, we've got a million people on our Blue Shield plan here in California. And we know that every year, 200,000 of them are going to get a prescription for a drug in this area. Um, company A, if we put you on our formulary, meaning we give you a high reimbursement rate, we make it easy for our patients to get your drug, you got to give us a better deal than company B. And so the PBM functions as this sort of agent trying to bring down the total drug costs on behalf of the insurance company. And they get paid typically as a percentage of how big those deals they negotiate are. It's like if you hired a lawyer and you said, look, I'll give you 5% of whatever deal you go and negotiate for me. So in some way, that's another layer of complexity here because we all kind of want insurance companies to push the prices down. We want them to go to big pharmas and say, give us a lower price. We're going to use all of our force to do that. And the PBMs help them do it. But at the same time, the PBMs are getting profits by negotiating these big rebates that, as we discussed, push up the retail prices. And where the retail prices really hurt the consumer are that when you go in with your insurance, you often have a copay. And the copay may be 10% of the list price. That's what you as the patient have to pay out of pocket. So if you as the patient have to do a copay that's 10% of the list price, then what matters to your pocketbook is how high is that list price, not how high is the net price. And so one solution here would be to say, if the insurance company and the PBM are gonna negotiate a big rebate and therefore a low net price, well then the patient ought to benefit from that too. Their 10% copay should be a percent of the net price, not of the list price. And, and so let's talk about going back to the negotiating, right? With, uh, if you have a um, kind of like challenger drug or, or you've, you, you have a, a new and improved version of a drug, let's say you're a smaller or, or you are a smaller up and coming biotech company, you know, how does the role of leverage factor into those negotiations? Um, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's a drug that's already been out there, but now you have a newer version to it, 
you know, a lot of this, the distribution channel being controlled and influenced by the PBM relative to the amount of rebate that they can negotiate versus what's in the best value or, or, or to take the best care of the patient. How do those two things conflict with one another in that lack of pricing transparency negotiation you're talking about? Well, um, as I said, the counterparties in the negotiation are the insurance company and the PBM. Let's think of them as one unit. And then the pharma company on the other side. And what the insurer basically wants is for these prices to be as low as possible on a net basis. Now, as we discussed, they may in fact have a perverse incentive to drive up the list prices, which is a whole other story. But when you think about, as you raised, uh, a new incumbent company, a, a new startup, say, that wants to challenge those incumbents, well, what that startup really wants is to get on the formulary. In other words, they want to go to these insurers and they want to say, look, we've got a much better product and you should cover our drug, meaning we want people who have your insurance to be able to get our drug. And unless you guys put us on your formulary, they won't be able to get it because then the, the customer would need to pay totally out of pocket. And so that's where you end up getting competition between the pharma companies and their competitors. This little emerging biotech we're hypothesizing has to go to the insurance company and say, please put us on your formulary. And the big incumbents are going to go back to them and say, keep that new drug off your formulary. We've got what our existing product. And you know, if you keep them off and keep our existing product on, we're going to give you a better deal on this other drug that's in a totally different space because these big pharma companies have big portfolios. So when they're negotiating with the insurer and the PBM, they're able to wield the leverage of negotiated pricing across their whole portfolio. And that really gives them a weapon to compete with these smaller startups that may have really innovative drugs. This is one reason why little drug companies almost always have to end up selling to a big drug company. Very hard to get in that game. That's the magic. That was the, that was the magic. So when you look at the distribution of the industry and you have these gatekeepers, right? And all of these now non-transparent incentive structures set up. And, and now we go back, let's go full circle back to pill pack, the promised land. Um, the hope is that you would say, oh, you know, could a marketplace model start to um, bring pricing transparency into this, start to eliminate, maybe not all, because you're still going to have the payers uh, that, that need to subsidize the cost of these drugs, but at least start to maybe provide a little bit more of a direct channel to the end consumer. Um, and let's say the up and coming, the emerging biotech in, in this scenario um, have a little bit uh, less of an uphill battle to fight along the way. And I don't know if this is actually happening, um, but that would be kind of the the desire, right? Or some of the thinking around that. Certainly set, what PillPack does have is a is a lower cost footprint in the sense that they don't, even though they are, I guess, now actually starting to look at setting up some physical uh, uh, pharmacies, but the cost structure of a pill pack, which is all mail delivery fulfillment for these drugs, is less. So theoretically, they should be able to take less margin and do a similar job to a PBM a little bit more efficiently. Um, that's some of the business model. But do you think that there is um, less of this? Do you think there's a way that they could try to deliver more on this idea of pricing transparency or allowing in more supply, a, a wider variety of supply, a more diverse array of supply, up and coming biotech companies um, for a more fluid type of marketplace approach? Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, uh, I'm reminded of the Jeff Bezos uh, quote, I think. I think he said this, um, or maybe it's just attributed to him, that, you know, your margin is my opportunity. And if you put it in the context of healthcare, it's sort of like anyone's margin in the healthcare economy is an opportunity for our society to save on the total cost of healthcare. So there are some people who there are good arguments ought to be making big profits in healthcare. Um, 
One such group is, is I would argue, the pharmaceutical companies or the, or the biotech companies, because you want them to have a real profit incentive to develop super innovative drugs. And when you give them a big enough incentive, they go and do that. No one's developing drugs commercially as a charity. They're doing it because you can make a lot of money if you succeed. So we kind of like them having profits. Now, there's another question of, you know, how much profits is enough profits? That's way above my pay grade. Um, but the bottom line is if they can't make money making drugs, you're not going to get cures. And we all like cures. Now, on the other hand, you look at these PBMs and you go, are the PBMs really adding value to this whole system? And no, I would say no. What do you think? You know, I, it, it's really, to be honest, it's hard for me to tell. And I'll tell you why it's hard for me to tell. Because the insurance companies are hiring them. And it's, it's difficult to know. You know, the insurance companies don't want to give away margin to a third party. Of course, as you point out, now you've had CVS integrate at, with PBM. And so I think what you saw happen there was the pharmacies, um, in some ways, the pharmacy, the insurance company, and the PBM are a little bit at odds with each other. So what's going to be very interesting now is you're seeing this vertical integration occur with companies like CVS, Caremark. And as that happens, it may actually end up being a great thing for the world because now they're looking at the whole system and they're saying, how do we maximize profits altogether in an efficient way as a company? Not, you know, if we're basically exporting margin to the PBM, let's stop doing that. You know, what you may see, in fact, is with these integrated insurance PBM companies, the PBM may essentially just become a profitless part of the insurance company. And in some ways, that's kind of what you want. It is. It is. Larry Merlo, CEO of CVS, certainly does not want that to happen. But, well, you know, so a couple things on that. Um, I think there, there are many, like CEO of Pfizer, um, CEO of another, you know, one of the, the kind of like blue chip pharma companies, they will all purport that PBMs take 50 cents on the dollar. Right now, as we've just said, what that actually means is is pretty wonky given the whole pricing situation here. But when you look at um, the amount of value that they create in the sense that, you know, their whole argument is I've got physical distribution. I've got stores within, say, 10 miles of, you know, 95 percent a blue cross of your insured population. No one else can give that to you. Well, there's this thing called the mail. And the interesting thing about PillPack was that PillPack actually started with, I believe, like an elderly subsection of the population that was actually where you actually saw it was it was actually difficult for these people to get in a car and go to the pharmacy to get their drugs. And it was actually more convenient for them to get it in the mail. And and all, by the way, sec, you know, here's your Monday pills, your Tuesday pills, your Wednesday pills, which everyone that's. You know, I know, I know my parents, they do that manually, right? They, they use a physical pill pack and split it up by day and it's a whole process. So, you know, I would argue that you see a kind of better customer experience innovation come along. We didn't even talk about the generics here on how if they're making a majority of their margin on the generics and you're saying that there is supplier, a lack of supplier diversity just in the traditional PBM distribution model because the, the big pharmas can use their breath, which I absolutely believe. And then you say, well, the PBM is making more margin on the generics. I mean, if, if there's competition from up and coming biotechs on the kind of branded, the, the newer drugs, there is at least 10 or 100x more competition on the creation of generics. And th there could be so much supplier diversity and competition on the generics to just you know, if not reduce all but obliterate the margin on the generic side of the drug. And just simply because you have a gatekeeper that says, well, I'm going to sell my own generic and I got to make margin on this stuff. So therefore, there's only so much shelf space. And guess what? Other generic companies from, say, in India, we're just not going to let you uh, sell your generics, even though they're perfectly acceptable uh, generic drugs. So I'm sure that stuff is happening all over the place. 
where this endless aisle concept of, of, say, a pill pack, you know, you don't have the physical constraints, which there is some credence to, right? But you just don't have the physical constraints of, I have a shelf, how much can I stock hold? I have central fulfillment capabilities. I can have a much wider array of generics and give more choice to customer around, you know, brand versus price and, and let them make these decisions. That's point one. The other thing that I see is I see the incumbents trying to fight back against the disruptor, in this case, the pill pack of the world, where you, we just saw this from September of 2019. Sure Scripts terminates contract with this Remy Health, hindering pill packs asset access to patient prescription data. Um, so I was digging into this. I was like, oh, okay, what's SureScripts? Oh, SureScripts basically is an industry solution. Um, they have this alliance of all of all the incumbents that you would write, all the, the known entities in the space here um, from every, you know, payers and PBMs and pharmacies and all the different vendors here are in this alliance. And then you say, oh, well, you know, what is this kind of group here? SureScripts. Okay, they've got a leadership team. And then you're, you know, I say, well, who owns this thing? And then we go down to the board. Um, and, you know, when you look at the board here, okay, we've got a guy from CVS Health. We've got a guy from Cigna. And then you have the community of pharmacists and chain drug stores. And this is the incumbents. These are the incumbents trying to say, oh, PillPack, you need this data to have customer information and these kinds of things to operate your business, oh, well, we're going to cut you off. Um, and so when I see the incumbent industry start to kind of take these, it's, a, it's legal, I still qualify it as a cheap shot. Um, and, and this is where the irony, and this is where I get worked up about the healthcare industry, right? You know, disruption, all these kinds of things, it's good. You can create money. You can create outsized returns and, and innovate and all these great things. And ultimately, you're delivering more value to the customer. The problem here is in healthcare, when you play these games, and I would call this a game, right? <clears throat> when you play these games to try and shut out the disruptor challengers, not only are you, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, doing it selfishly, but you're actually hurting people's livelihood, right? You're actually you're actually increasing their cost of care. You're decreasing their um, availability to get treatment or to get access to, to affordable health care. And it's just, it's not okay. So um, I when I see this stuff happening, to me, it says, okay, <laughs> Amazon pill pack is onto something because these guys are getting so scared that they're having to cut off like data flows and stuff to pill pack just to make their life, their life a little bit harder. So you know, if we were to if, let's let's just kind of go a little bit farther out, do some like wonky hypothetical stuff. Right. We know that Amazon and JP Morgan and Berkshire are doing some kind of roll up uh, initiative here. If one of the things that we're talking about is pricing transparency, um, you know, if if you're able to say, OK, however many millions of people are employed by Amazon, JP Morgan, and, and Berkshire's portfolio companies. And if, if they create one giant self-insurance company, and then they go to the pharma companies and, and uh, the wholesalers, and they say, look, and, and, and they, are the, they are the payer in that scene. They're, they're, they're self-insuring, so they are the payer. And they say, look, um, we're going to distribute, we're going to buy these drugs from you. We have millions and millions of people that need to be covered by this. Probably tens of millions of people. Definitely, actually. Um, and all of the drug prices, we're going to get rid of this thing called list price, net price. It's just going to be the price. And that price is going to be available on PillPack. And that's where all of our employees are now going to be able to go and, and buy these drugs from. Um, but... We're also going to open that up, that marketplace up to, you know, think about what portion of the population is not insured, like uh, 15 or percent. Still, or, it's still in the tens of millions of people. Right. It's a sizable. Um, I'm not saying that they're the ideal target user for this, but I'm just saying if you were to open up transparent pricing. You, you on also this, have people with high deductibles, which is increased under Obamacare, which is one of the things DA talks about in his article, where if the list price is going up and you have a high deductible, you're still paying more. 
and the idea of choice and the whole point of the high deductible was consumers will be more careful about where they spend their money. But if there's no transparency on what things actually cost, the idea of choice is kind of an illusion, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, how do you get to, you know, if they had enough weight, which maybe they do, I don't know. But if they had enough weight to actually say, we are going to have a transparent marketplace and maybe there are some like volume discount things, but by and large part, this is an, an open marketplace. People can come buy these drugs. You're going to sell them at a price that you're still going to make margin on. But this whole illusion of rebates and all of these backdoor negotiations um, goes out the window. The insurance company can still cover a certain amount of, you know, of the one price, the real price in this scenario. Um, so it's not like you're getting rid of your insurance company, but um, we're going to use our demand and our leverage to, to decree that. Now, um, I'm not saying that that's what they're working on or that they have enough leverage to pull that off, but do you think something like that starts to chip away at these games that we're talking about, right? Does like that pricing transparency, is that kind of, I mean, how you get that is is the difficult thing, but if you can get it, I mean, it seems like, not that it's 100% the silver, bu silver, silver bullet, but maybe it's like 80% the silver, silver bullet, right? It, it starts to actually get some semblance of an even, even playing field. When we're talking about generics, when we're talking about branded drugs, what is, what am I really trying to buy here? And if I'm the consumer, how do you enable me to make a decision about, you know, quality versus price, uh, convenience versus price yeah, and I mean, empower think, the consumer? At, at the end of the day, medicine is really complicated. It's very hard for the consumer to navigate on their own. And that's why consumers or patients often defer to doctors or to right. their insurance company. Most people want to go to the doctor. They want to be told what to do. Do I need this pill? I'll go get it. I'll take it. And they trust the advice they're given on that front. And so what you really want is for the patient to be guided through the healthcare system in a way that is going to maximize the quality of outcomes and minimize the costs associated with getting those outcomes. Um, uh, you know, one vision of the future here is along the lines you're proposing, which is take this, you know, JP Morgan, Amazon, Berkshire thing that Atul Gawande is now running. And imagine that, you know, these guys as a big insurance company basically say, look, we've got all these people that it's our job to take care of. And why are we taking care of them? Because it's an employee benefit. When you work at these companies, you get great health insurance. So now as an insurer, what do we want them to do? Well, we want them as the insurance company to try and push down the prices that everyone is charging them. We want them to push down the prices that the drug companies charge them. And we really want them to push down the prices that hospitals charge them. So we want them to use that leverage to reduce the prices. Um, at the same time, we don't want them to push down the prices if that's going to erode the quality of care. And so what I think you want at a very general level is a public policy regime that rewards insurance companies for achieving very high quality outcomes and spending as little money as possible. The one place you really see that right now in our system is in Medicare Advantage, which is uh, Medicare Part C. This is um, a, an option you have when you're on Medicare, where as an alternative to getting traditional government Medicare, which they, they call, uh, I forget what they call it, traditional Medicare or whatever, um, you have an option of buying Medicare coverage through a private insurance company. And what the government does is they go to that insurance company and they say, look, if you take care of Alex for a year, we're going to give you $10,000 for that year. And you know what? As long as you deliver care that is of a certain standard, if you save money on taking care of him, you can keep the, the difference. In other words, what you want is you want the insurance company's profit to be driven by how low they can push the prices down. And if you had this happen 
then the insurance companies really become the force for good in the whole system. And the next article I'm going to write, as you'll see, is going to be about hospitals and how they set prices, which is also really interesting. But the bottom line there is that um, in many cases, hospitals have a lot of leverage relative to insurance companies. And so they're able to consistently raise their prices. And the insurance companies don't have a great way of fighting back. So what we really want, just to summarize, is we want the insurance companies in America, including the government, Medicare and Medicaid, to have more power to negotiate down prices. And you don't want them to have any incentive for prices to go up, which, as we talked about, they currently have in the system. That's really the problem, is they have an incentive for prices to go up. Yes, with, with my magical pill pack um, price transparent marketplace, if the traditional uh, ins insurer insurers were to then uh, use that, then it would skew all of their ratios and you know how much money they're allocating towards patient care, and it could potentially make them non-compliant with the regulation, which is not the focus, right? It's as you're saying, value of care and doing it efficiently, and you have the same lack of pricing transparency on the healthcare provider side, and more and more, guess what? Uh, consolidation on the healthcare provider side. The interesting trend that you've seen is the Medicare Advantage thing is is population health, which is the same idea of the insurance company going to a healthcare provider, a hospital, and saying, "Hey, I'll, well, you know, if the government's giving me ten thousand, I'll give you like nine thousand or ninety five hundred healthcare system, um, and if you take care of the patient, then you get the same economic or similar economic structure." And I think. What that's going is like, how can you localize that ownership of healthcare closer to the patient as opposed to the, the farther that it's abstracted away um, or there is no ownership, then you're just going to see the, the wrong incentive structure um, that's trying to optimize for the wrong, say, KPIs. I think that's right. And what, what, you, what you get, I mean, what you get is ultimately in some of these, you know, ACOs, as they're called cannibal care organizations or um, you know, population health approaches, um, you sort of emulate something that looks like managed care, it looks like uh, HMOs, like um, you know, Kaiser is the classic example, and that it's both the insurance company and it's the provider. Um, mm -hmm. What you really want is a lot of vigorous competition between these different integrated providers. You know, right now, if you go to Kaiser, you may have a great experience, but it can also be like you're dealing with the Russian government, you know, in, in, <laughs> under the Soviet Union. So because it's a huge, you know, monolithic organization, you don't, as the patient, have a lot of, you can't go get a, a doctor who's not employed by Kaiser. So there are trade-offs here. The question is going to be, what's, what's a new kind of middle path that we can follow that incorporates the wisdom of a more open market, like you see in PPO insurance, with the mm -hmm. uh, value and interest alignment that you have in a sort of managed care model. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we have a couple questions here. One question is, how do you, I don't know if you know the answer to this. How do European governments with socialized healthcare deal with rebates? You got an answer for that you one? No, I have no idea. I, the, the one thing I'll mention is that, um, you know, people have argued that we in the United States subsidize the low cost of drugs around the world. Part of the reason that's, they, that's what I was going to bring up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so but one of the reasons why people say that is that our government is not allowed to negotiate with the pharmaceutical right. companies, but a law that was passed. And on the other hand, many of these um, socialized systems uh, are ones in which the government does negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies. So they're able to say, look, if you want to be in Germany, this is the price we're going to pay you. Take it or leave it. And so, um, in some ways, the whole U.S. system ends up absorbing some of the costs that other people are saving, which is one great reason why it would be nice if our government had more negotiating power with the pharma companies. Because, you know, Medicare remains the biggest insurance company in America, and yet we don't benefit from it having this negotiating leverage. Yeah, it's, you know, um, a popular term these days would be this thing called tariffs. And I think, you know, you could argue that there is essentially a tax uh, that we are paying in the U.S. because, as you're saying, we are someone needs to pay for the innovation for the pharma companies. Right. 
Net net, yeah. I'd say the pharma companies, the U.S. pharma. I mean, we have a many U.S. pharma companies. We have many. We have a really great biotech sector in the U.S. Um, but we really aren't able to benefit from that internationally. I mean, this is probably one of, if maybe the only major, you know, pseudo free market for drug pricing. Uh, and then everyone says, oh, well, look at Europe's pricing. I mean, if if the U.S. were to 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 take all the margin out and negotiate directly with the pharma companies, I mean, you know, wh where do they get the uh, the innovation dollars instead? You know, to me, what would be interesting is if and I, by the way, I think the pharma company, pharma industry has done a horrible job lobbying the Trump administration, right? You'd think that they'd be lobbying the Trump administration to to have that, that the administration say, hey, Europe, you're putting a tariff on our drugs coming into your country and you need to now provide a more free flow or so, at least a little bit freer, you know, drug pricing regime um, versus you just being a single source country. Uh, and, and, and let our pharma companies get a little bit more margin or get, you know, paid for the innovation. Um, but you don't really hear any of that. I don't know if they've made that a focal point, but you don't really hear any of that as, um, as the rhetoric towards, uh, uh, essentially a tax that we as the, the, the U S are having to pay somewhat on behalf of these other countries that are negotiating at the government level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, you know, to be honest, I don't have enough. Um, knowledge of how these international negotiations are done under global trade agreements. So um, it's an area I want to learn more about, but I mean, it's a fascinating topic of shifting the cost burden around the world. So one last question here. Um, and uh, oh, well, this is someone, you know, we've kind of talked about how do you deal with orphan diseases? Thousands of patients have them, but economically rarely makes sense for drug companies to research without some incentives. So like rare diseases, there's so much opportunity in rare diseases these days. Um, when you talk about these up and coming emerging biotech companies, I mean, so many of them must be in the rare diseases space. When you, when you have a clogged distribution system or this, ma these massive gatekeepers in the distribution channel, um, any other points there? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there are definitely arguments to be made that there are some rare diseases or many rare diseases where the economic incentives for the private market to take on cures are still not strong enough. And public policymakers ought to consider how we can create incentives. That being said, one of the great successes of policy in the past couple decades has actually been incentivizing the development of drugs for rare and orphan diseases. And the FDA has granted what they call breakthrough therapy status and fast track review processes. These are basically policy tools that make it more attractive for, for small companies to go after products in rare diseases. And one of the challenges as we talk about drug pricing um, is that you don't want to um, disincentivize this behavior. <laughs> It's a very good thing right now that you have all these little companies working on cures to diseases that maybe only have a few thousand patients, because if they don't do that, these patients may die or, or just go without cures for decades. And so on the one hand, you know, we don't want pharmaceutical companies um, producing very incremental, almost meaningless innovation, and then price gouging consumers like with insulin and some of these very basic medications. On the other hand, you may need to tolerate a system where we could understand why a company charges a million dollars for one dose of a drug. And it's again, it's very complicated, but it's not just greed that's driving that. Um, you know, very often you can look at what it costs to take care of a patient with a disease for a couple decades. And it may cost in some diseases, you know, $5 million. So if a pharmaceutical company comes out and says, look, we've got a one dose medication that can eliminate all of that cost, going from $5 million to a million dollars is actually a wonderful thing for the whole system. Now, whether it should be a million dollars or $500,000, again, it's a complex issue. But the point is just that What's actually happening here 
is much, much more complicated than what you see in the headlines. And I think as we have this political season where people are passionately rallying behind different candidates, it's important to, um, just as a, a voter even, try to dig in and understand this stuff with a little more nuance because the politicians are always gonna try and sell you the simple argument. They're gonna try and pick out an easy bad guy and say that bad guy's greedy. Let's take the money out of these evil pharma companies. And it's not that simple. And we could easily as a society shoot ourselves in the foot by disincentivizing this sort of innovation that I'm talking about, which is actually a very good thing. Absolutely. And the, and the incentives that you're talking about for rare disease is basically what the government is able to do by doing fast tracks they're basically reducing the significant amount of costs in the clinical trial phase, right? Which can take years, many, not just tens, but sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars um, to go through that process. So that's an immediate ROI, huge boost to the ROI and the ability for them to just get to market faster and uh, without as much cost. So yeah, there are big drivers and levers that the government can pull kind of in the drug creation and approval stage that's where the government controls on the distribution side um you know they can they can maybe provide some incentives from what they control through medicare medicaid these kinds of things that's in their purview the private insurer payer scenario they probably have a little less control or not maybe so much outside of setting policy um, when it comes to the distribution of these drugs, but there's so much opportunity now. And these are probably a number of the things that you are investing in, um, in these rare diseases, therapeutics that are up and coming and what we can use with big data and AI uh, and all those kinds of things. So that's where it gets really exciting. A big reason why hopefully um, the distribution of this will be able to make some progress here. Me, I'm skeptical that it's going to come from the incumbents, unfortunately. Just the, the actions that I see from the incumbents don't support that they're going to do anything but try to kind of preserve the existing model. Particularly on the, um, the PBMs and pharmacy companies. The PBMs, pharma, yeah. but also the, um, the, the, um, the uh, EHR companies and, and the Epics yeah. and the Cerners of the world not wanting to open up their data and kind of recognize that we operate in the year 2019. It's it's still like, I guess, 1989 for them, uh, where everything is on-prem and the idea Lockdown. of cloud yeah. Yeah, is, is, is not a, you know, a fun word for them. But the type of things that you're investing in, the types of kind of the, the, um, the disruptors, which can be startups, but it can also be um, the large tech companies and, and, and the Walmarts of the world, but the Amazons of the world, the Berkshires of the world trying to get into this space and kind of force change policy side, um, as you're talking about, very important that people kind of understand the nuance of this, don't have a knee jerk reaction um, in the assessment of what's really going on. Hopefully this, hopefully we'll be able to make some progress here um, in some of this and we'll keep on following your uh, your your next article, which is going to look at the healthcare provider space, that'll be very interesting as we continue to dig deeper in healthcare. Uh, DA, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Really amazing stuff. And uh, definitely keep us posted. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Thanks for joining us. And we'll talk to you next week.